Welcome back, Highlanders, to part two of chapter three. Uh, in our chapter three, part one video, we talked about the law of demand and how that relates to that downward sloping demand curve. We talked about the difference between a change in quantity demanded versus a change in demand, and we took a look at some shifters of the demand curve. So all that stuff that we talked about demand, we are also going to talk about here with supply in this part two video, starting off with the uh, law of supply that says there is a direct relationship between the price of a good or service and the amount that suppliers are willing to produce. So again, there's a direct or positive relationship between the price of a good and the amount that a supplier is willing to produce and sell. So now we're talking about the law of supply or the supply curve, I want you to try to put yourself in the minds of a seller. So you're out there selling goods, not buying goods. And all this law of supply says is that at higher prices, you're going to want to try to produce and sell more goods because you get a greater reward for doing so. And any uh, positive or direct relationship is going to result in an upward sloping uh, supply curve. All right, so again, any direct or positive relationship results in that upward sloping curve. So let's go ahead and talk about a positive or direct relationship when graphing out uh, this uh, uh, upward sloping curve here. So remember back in the part one video, we talked about two things that were negative, re negatively related, and that was um, your GPA and your hours spent partying or drinking. So now we're going to take a look at two things that are positively related. And so that's going to include your GPA again. But this time we're going to look at hours studying. So if you don't spend any time studying, so you spend zero hours a week studying or watching lecture videos or doing anything, then you're probably going to end up with that 0.0, .0 GPA. You're not going to pass too many classes. All right now, if you spend maybe uh, two hours a week studying or watching lecture videos, then you might end up with that 1.0 GPA and we'll pull out a D in uh, your classes. If you were to spend, say, maybe four hours a week studying or watching lecture videos, then you might be able to get that 2.0 GPA. If you were uh, able or willing to spend, say, six hours a week studying, watching these lecture videos and completing assignments and things like that, you might be able to get that 3.0 GPA. And if you could spend maybe eight hours a week studying and watching lecture videos and completing assignments, then you'll have a 4.0 GPA. So again, connect these dots. And what you have there is a direct relationship or a very upward sloping curve. Upward sloping meaning that again we read graphs from left to right. So if you were running along this graph from left to right, you'd be running uphill uh, rather than downhill. All right. So again, if we wanted to change this into a supply curve, then all we have to do is change those hours spent studying into price. So now this is say eight dollars, six dollars, four dollars, and two dollars. And we change this GPA into, say, quantity. And basically all this say, is saying is that at a price of $0, as you might expect, a producer is not willing to produce and sell any. At a price of $2, a producer would be willing to produce and sell maybe one unit. And if uh, you, they got paid $4 for uh, selling this unit, they might try to produce and sell two of these. At a price of $6, they might be willing to produce and sell three units. At a price of $8, they'd be willing to produce and sell four units. So again, the higher the price and the more a seller is willing to produce and sell. And when you're talking about this relationship between price and quantity supplied, we have that very upward sloping supply curve. Right? So that's how the law of supply works. Let's go uh, through an example here and derive ourselves a supply curve. So if we're talking about, say, selling eggs, right, then the same story holds. Uh, so here is a, um, a chart here telling us how many eggs that we are, uh, well, our uh, sellers are willing to produce and sell at these different prices. So at a price of $2, you might have 10, say, cartons of eggs being produced. Uh, if you had a price of $3, you might have 20 cartons of eggs being produced. 
At a price of $4, you might have 30 cartons. At a price of $5, you might have 40 cartons. So once again, let's if we want to graph this out, we could certainly chart these numbers and see what it looks like. There's our graph. And now we're looking at the relationship between price. So we're going to put a P here on the vertical axis and quantity. So we're going to put a Q here on our horizontal axis. All right. So again, if we're talking about a price of $2, if you are an egg farmer and you only get $2 for producing and selling your eggs, then you might only be willing to work hard enough to send maybe 10 cartons of eggs to the market. Now, if as an egg producer, you were told that, hey, for whatever reason, people want to buy eggs more so we can raise the price $3 per carton, well, then you're going to be more eager to go out there and produce and sell eggs. You're going to get up a little bit early in the morning, maybe get a few more chickens on your farm, get a few more eggs to the market. You might be willing to produce and sell, say, 20 cartons of eggs at that particular price. At a price of $4, Per dozen eggs then you might be willing to again produce and sell 30 eggs at that particular price and finally at a price of five dollars per dozen eggs you might be willing to produce and sell maybe 40 cartons at that particular price right so again we've got these dots here in this graph so let's go ahead and connect those dots And as you connect them again, we have an upward sloping supply curve representing that supply of eggs. So if you've gone into the grocery store and you've tried to find some eggs and you're not able to find some, a potential cure for that is to allow the price of eggs to rise. If the price of eggs goes up from, say, maybe $4 per carton to 5 or $6 per carton, then you're definitely going to see more eggs in the, grocery, in the grocery store. You're probably not going to have as much trouble finding them in the future. So again, when we're talking about the law of supply, put yourself into the mind of the producer. There's that direct relationship between price and quantity supplied, meaning that when price goes up, we're willing to produce and sell more, or quantity supplied will go up. If price were to go down, then we'd be willing to produce and sell less, right? That quantity supplied would go down. So again, that's kind of what our supply curve looks like as a result of that direct or positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. So again, please note that as price increases, quantity supplied increases with it. Or again, when we're talking about this supply, uh, law of supply, when price goes up, we as producers are willing to produce and sell more. Quantity supply goes up. If price were to go down, we as producers are willing to produce and sell less. Our quantity supplied will go down. All right. So again, there's that direct or positive relationship between price and quantity supplied. So let's go ahead and move on a little bit and talk about the difference between a change in supply versus a change in quantity supplied. Now, if you understood that difference between a change in demand versus a change in quantity demanded, then again, this should be pretty easy for you, mostly your view, because the theory is pretty much the same. So a change in quantity supplied is a movement along the curve. So again, you're going from one point on the supply curve to a different point on that very same supply curve. And just like a change in quantity demanded, it's caused by a change in one thing and one thing only, and that is a change in the current price of that good. So an increase in quantity supplied is a movement up the curve to the right. Again, that is us producing more in response to that uh, increase in price. A decrease in quantity supplied is a movement down the curve or to the left. That is us as sellers producing less in response to a decrease and the selling price of that good. So let's go ahead and go through a quick example to graph that out. Once again, I'm gonna exit the uh, full screen mode here so that we can use our different colors. So let's go ahead and draw ourselves a graph. So let's say that we got, again, price and quantity. Price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis. And let's say that we have this upward sloping supply curve that we just talked about, indicating again that positive or direct relationship between price and quantity supply. 
So let's say that you are um, a uh, somebody who provides dog walking services, and you get paid maybe ten dollars per walk. So for every dog you walk, you get ten dollars for doing so. Well, you might be willing to walk maybe ten dogs uh, in a particular uh, day, or maybe during a particular week, uh, if you get paid ten dollars per walk to do so. Now, if for whatever reason the uh, desire to uh, pay people to walk dogs has increased, so you got an increase in demand for those dog walking services, so that the price goes up to maybe twenty dollars per walk. If you all of a sudden get twenty dollars for every dog you walk, you might make yourself available to walk more dogs. Right? You might try to go out there and walk twenty dogs in say a given day or maybe a given week. Right? So again, we call this point A, and we call this point B, right? And that shows you, again, that at a higher price, you're willing to provide more of this particular service. So again, if you are, say, a dog walker, you might notice that during those summer months, when it's really hot out, particularly in Riverside, people might be more eager to pay you more money to go ahead and walk their dog for them. So again, that'd be a movement from point A to point B on this curve, right? So again, when you go from A to B, on this particular curve, right? That's going to be an increase, not in supply, but in quantity supply. You're willing to walk more dogs because the price you get paid to walk dogs has increased. Now, if for whatever reason, people are willing to pay you less to walk their dog, maybe because they don't need a dog walker anymore given the fact that everybody's home all the time as a result of this, uh, uh, quarantine or social distancing that we're practicing, then you might only have people willing to pay you $10 to walk their dog instead of $20 to walk their dog, right? Well, that movement from B to A, that is a decrease in quantity supplied. That is uh, you, again, walking dogs less because you're getting paid less to do so. So you ask yourself, why am I uh, walking more dogs or why am I providing more of this good or service? If it's because the selling price of the good or service has increased, then that is an increase in quantity supplied, not supply. Moving on then, as you might imagine, a change in supply is a shift of the curve. It's the entire curve picking up and moving to the right or to the left. And that's caused by a change in anything that affects producers' desire to make and sell the good other than the price of the good itself. So anything that affects your desire as a producer to go out there and make more or less of something other than the price you can sell the good for, that is what is going to shift the supply curve. And we'll talk about some shifters of supply here in a couple minutes. But first, just note that an increase in supply, just like an increase in demand, is the entire curve picking up and shifting to the right. Remember, all increases are shifts or movements to the right. A decrease in supply is the entire curve picking up and shifting to the left. Again, all decreases are movements or shifts to the left. So let's go back to our uh, previous graph here and take a look at those shifts. So let's say that something happens that causes you to want to go out there and walk more dogs. Maybe the cost of walking dogs has gone down for you for whatever reason. right? Maybe it's uh, cheaper to go out there and get those... Uh, plastic bags that you can use to pick up the dog's excrement, or maybe it's cheaper to buy leashes or water bowls or whatever, right? So you get paid the same for walking the dog, but now it's cheaper for you to provide this service. Then that supply curve is going to pick up and shift to the right. So we're going to call this S2. And as you can see here at the same uh, 10 price of $10, you're going to be willing to walk more dogs than you were before, maybe say 18 dogs instead of 10. And at that same price of $20, you're going to be willing to walk more dogs than you were before. Maybe 36 dogs instead of 20, right? So again, you're willing to walk more dogs at all the same price, prices that you'd be able to sell your dog walking services to. So real briefly, we got to make sure that we label that as S1. So again, when we're talking about going from one curve to a different curve like S1 to S2, that is an increase, not in quantity supplied, even though you are providing more of this service, 
but that is an increase in supply. Right, so that's again what we call it when we go from one curve to an entirely different curve. You're willing to supply more of this good or service at all these uh, same prices. Now, again, if something happens that maybe increased the cost of walking dogs, but the selling price stayed the same, you might be less eager to do it. And that'd be represented by a decrease in supply, which might look a little bit like that, right? So basically what this is saying is at the same price of $10, so you still get $10 for walking dogs, but now maybe the cost of those plastic bags used to pick up their extra mint has increased, or maybe the price of dog treats or water bowls or things like that have increased, making it more expensive for you to go out there and walk dogs, then you'd be willing to do less of it. You might only walk, say, five dogs at this particular uh, price rather than the 10 that you're willing to walk when you were at S1 or the 18 that you're willing to walk when we were at S2. Now, even at a price of $20 per dog walk, you're only going to be willing to walk maybe 10 dogs at that particular price uh, as opposed to the 20 that you'd be walking if you were at S1 or the 36 that you'd be walking if you were at S2. Right, so again, when we go from S1 to S3, or when that supply curve picks up and shifts to the left, that is a decrease, not in quantity supplied, but in supply, even though you are indeed uh, doing less. Right, so again, ask yourself, why am I producing and selling more? Is it because the price has gone up? If that's the case, that's an increase in quantity supplied. Or is it because uh, something else has happened that has made me want to produce and sell more? Maybe the cost of making it going down, right? That is an increase in supply. So make sure you understand the difference between a change in supply versus a change in quantity supplied. Again, very similar in theory to that difference between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded, right? So again, make sure you understand those differences. You know, it can be kind of an easy thing to confuse on the exam because the wording is very similar. But again, it's uh, something that the more you practice, I think the easier it gets. All right, so let's talk about those shifters of supply or things that cause that supply curve to pick up and shift either to the right or to the left. So the first of which is kind of the one that we highlighted in the dog walking example, and that is a change in resource price. And remember, a resource in economics is anything that we use to produce something else. And again, this is where students might get confused. If it's the price of the good itself that you are producing and selling, if that's what's changing, then that is a change in quantity supply. But if it is a price in the ingredient used to produce the good that you are selling, well, then that's a change in the cost of making the good. That is a shift of the supply curve. So, for example, if you are a company that sells cars and um, the price of cars goes up, then you are willing and able to produce and sell more cars. That's an increase in quantity supply. But if you're a car company that produces and sells cars, and the price of tires, which is an ingredient used to make those cars, goes up, meaning that you're selling the car for the same price, but it's now more expensive to get that car to the showroom, right? Well, then that's going to be a change in supply, right? So here's the way this works. If it's the price of the resource, not the good itself, but the resource used to produce the good, if the price of that resource is going up, it's more expensive to make and sell these things. So all else constant or ceteris paribus, that's going to cause supply to go down or you to try to produce and sell less. Now, if the price of the resource, like the tire used to uh, help make the car, if that goes down, then that's going to cause supply to go up. You're going to try to produce and sell more. So again, that price the resource and supply have that inverse relationship. If price the resource goes up, supply will go down or shift left. If price the resource goes down, supply will go up or shift to the right. And the second thing that would shift the supply curve is a change in technology. So technology tends to make things cheaper and easier to produce. And for that reason, the better technology we have, the more we're able to supply, right? So again, this one's pretty easy relationship to understand, but as technology improves, supply tends to increase with it, or we're able to produce and sell more. So uh, better technology causes a supply curve to shift to the right. Uh, it's kind of hard to think of examples of this, but a decrease in technology, like again, if a meteor comes through and like destroys all of our satellites, 
then that might cause our supply to go down or shift to the left. Uh, kind of a uh, nice example of this is something that you might not necessarily think of is that if you ever go down to uh, Kenya, you might see that all of or most of business is done on cell phones down there. And so the improvement in technology that comes with creating these cell phones has uh, drastically increased business activity in Kenya or caused supply to go up. And the funny thing is that nobody probably thought about that when they were thinking about wanting a cell phone, right? So a cell phone was invented because some rich jerk sitting in his limousine stuck in rush hour in New York City was like, I need to be able to talk to my employees and continue to do business while stuck in my car, figure out a way to make that happen. That kind of a technology that gets created from a result of that impulse actually helps poor Kenyans do more business and become more uh, wealthy. Right, so again, an increase in technology tends to cause that supply to go up. Number three, when it comes to shifters of supply is a change in nature and or politics. Right, so sometimes uh, these changes in nature or politics can influence how much we can produce as an economy. And this one eh, kind of really just depends on what that change is. So there's no uh, necessary uh, automatic relationship here that works. I'll give you a couple of examples. So a crop freeze in, say, California or Florida due to some unseasonably cold weather that destroys the orange crop, that's going to cause the supply of oranges to go down. So that would be a change in nature that would reduce the supply of oranges. A change in nature that might increase the supply of something would be uh, unseasonably good weather. So if weather is unusually good uh, for growing this particular crop, that might cause the supply of that crop to increase. Example of a change in politics would be uh, the uh, oil embargo against the United States in the 1970s that we talked about in chapter one caused the supply of crude oil to the United States to go down, right? So as a result, there was uh, less oil in the United States resulting in those gas shortages. So that would be a change in politics that would have uh, influenced supply. A kind of example of both nature and politics would be this coronavirus epidemic that we are currently living in uh, under. Right, so the coronavirus is kind of a change in nature that has led to a political change, and that is that uh, enforcement of social distancing. So both of those have, co have combined to drastically reduce supply as businesses have closed down in response to this pandemic. Right, so again, changes in nature of politics kind of depends on what those changes are, but they're usually pretty obvious to figure out what's going to happen to supply as a result of that change. And the fourth one is kind of related to politics, but the reason why we separate it is because there's a definite relationship here, and that is a change in taxes. So basically the way this works is that the higher the taxes are, or the more the government uh, takes money away from you from doing something, then the less of it people do, uh, tend to do. So when taxes go up, supply goes down. So the more the government taxes your income or taxes your dog walking services, then the fewer dogs you'll walk. Uh, conversely speaking, if taxes were to go down, supply tends to go up. And if the government were to, say, reduce your income taxes or reduce the taxes on your dog walking services, then you might be willing to walk more dogs because you get to keep more of your money. So supply would increase as a result. So those are the four shifters of supply that we're going to talk about in this class. Again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize them in any particular order, but if I tell you that taxes have increased, be able to tell me what happens to supply. If I tell you that the price of a resource has decreased, be able to tell me what happens to supply. If I tell you that we've seen an improvement in technology, be able to tell me what happens to supply. And of course, if I give you some kind of political uh, change or a change in nature, be able to infer from that what's going to happen to supply. And then let's go ahead and do a practice question to make sure we understand this. So it says, which of the following would most likely increase the supply of liquor? So which of the following would most likely increase the supply of liquor? or make that supply of liquor shift to the right. So again, let's take a look at these answer choices. So A says an increase in the cost of gasoline used to transport liquor to the market. That means it's gonna be more expensive to get liquor to the market. That's something that's gonna make supply go down, not up. And again, we're looking for which one's going to increase the supply of liquor. So we know it's not A. If it's more expensive to get liquor to the market, supply of liquor might go down. An increase in the price of beer, a substitute good, means that people might buy less beer and more liquor, but that's a demand thing, not a supply thing. So in other words, that's going to make the demand for liquor go up. And I'm asking which one makes the supply of liquor increase, so we know it's not B. 
A new report which highlights the negative effects that excessive alcohol consumption can have on both your physical and mental state of well-being is something that would probably reduce a consumer's uh, taste and preference for alcohol. Again, that's going to make demand go down, not up. And so, again, we're talking about which of the following makes supply, not demand, increase. So we know it's not C. So by default, we kind of know it's D, but let's check out this answer for D. It says the discovery of a new fermentation process that makes liquor production cheaper and easier. Right, basically what we're talking about is an increase in technology that makes it cheaper and easier to get liquor to the market. That is definitely something that's going to make supply go up, according to those four shifters we just talked about. So D is the answer you're looking for on that one. All right, so that concludes our discussion of the law of supply, the difference between a change in quantity supplied and supply, and the shifters of that supply curve. So now that we've talked about both demand and supply, we're going to talk about a concept that can be applied to both of those, and that is this idea of elasticity. So elasticity, again, can be applied to both demand and supply. So there can be an elasticity of demand, and there can be an elasticity of supply. And elasticity just refers to how responsive somebody is to a change in that price. So uh, we know that when price goes up, consumers, we as buyers, we tend to buy less. But how much less? Just a little bit less or a lot less? We also know that when price goes up, uh, producers or sellers tend to produce and sell more. But again, is it just a little bit more or is it a lot more? Elasticity is what helps us answer that particular question. So if we say that, say, the demand for a good is inelastic, we mean that buyers are not sensitive to the change in price. So if price goes up, even by a lot, buyers might just buy a little bit less. If we were to say that the supply of something is relatively inelastic, that means sellers are not that sensitive to a change in price. I mean, that even if the price went up by a lot, they might just try to produce and sell a little bit more. And anything that is inelastic, whether it be uh, uh, demand or supply, those curves tend to be steeper or more vertical, whereas things that are uh, less uh, inelastic or more elastic, those curves tend to be flatter. So if we say the demand for something is relatively elastic, that means that buyers are sensitive to those changes in prices, meaning that even if the price goes up by just a little bit, buyers might choose to buy a whole lot less. And again, if we say that the supply of something is relatively elastic, Again, we mean that the sellers are sensitive to that change in price. So even if the price goes up by just a little bit, those sellers are going to try to produce and sell a whole lot more. And those elastic curves, again, tend to be flatter. So let's go through an example to make sure we understand what these uh, curves look like on a particular graph. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and, again, exit out of this so that we can uh, use different colors in drawing this graph. So let's go ahead and draw a graph that represents elasticity. So again, we're going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis that represent price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. And what I'm going to do here is on the very same uh, graph, I'm going to draw two demand curves of different elasticities. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this first demand curve. As you can see, this demand curve is going to be, I didn't work out like it was supposed to. Erase that and draw it in blue. Right. So this first demand curve is going to be relatively flat. And this is going to be our demand for, say, Pepsi. So we won't go into too much detail about what makes things uh, more elastic versus inelastic. But one reason why Pepsi might be more elastic is because if the price of Pepsi goes up, Consumers can switch to something else like, say, Coca-Cola or some other soft drink instead. So, again, even if the price goes up by a little bit, people might buy a whole lot less because there's a lot of good substitutes out there for Pepsi that people can switch to. And so let's go ahead and draw another graph, another demand curve of something that's far more inelastic. And, again, because this is more inelastic, it's going to be a much steeper demand curve, something that maybe looks something like this. So both of these are downward sloping demand curves, just one is more flat and the other is more steep. And let's say that this is the demand for, say, crack cocaine. All right. So let's say that you are an individual who is out there buying both Pepsi and crack. 
let's say that uh, you are buying, say, five cases of Pepsi and five, uh, I don't know how they're sold, I guess, Crack Rocks every single week. I haven't done too much crack in my past, so I'm not really familiar with how the market works. But let's say that the price of Pepsi and the price of a Crack Rock is both $10 per unit. So it's $10 for, say, a case of Pepsi, and it's $10 for a Crack Rock. And at this price of $10, you are buying five cases of Pepsi and five Crack Rocks every week. All right now, again, let's say that the price drastically increases. Let's say it doubles for both products. So maybe $20 per case of Pepsi and $20 for that Crack Rock. Well, at $20 per case of Pepsi, you're going to drastically reduce how much Pepsi you're choosing to buy. Uh, in the case of uh, the price of Pepsi doubling, it might cause you to go from buying five cases of Pepsi down to, say, just one case of Pepsi. There's a bunch of other different soft drinks that you can buy instead. Right? Again, there's a lot of things you can drink that's going to be pretty close or pretty similar to what you get out of when you drink Pepsi. However, if the price of crack doubles from, say, $10 to $20, well, you might buy less crack, but just a little bit less crack because there's nothing like that crack. There's no substitute out there that's going to give you that same feeling that crack does. So again, you might go from five crack rocks down to four every week. So you might just reduce your consumption by a little bit, right? So again, we just reduce our consumption by a little bit when it comes to crack from five down to four. So we say that our demand for crack is relatively inelastic. However, when it comes to Pepsi, we reduce our consumption by a whole lot. We go from five all the way down to one. So we say our demand for Pepsi is relatively elastic. And again, that's why those elastic uh, demand curves are flatter and those inelastic demand curves are steeper. So again, make sure you kind of understand that much when it comes to elasticity. If you've taken Econ 3, then you know we go into a lot more detail about how to calculate elasticity in a, uh, a chapter in Econ 3. If you haven't taken Econ 3, don't worry about it. This is what you need to know about elasticity moving forward for this class. You don't really know uh, that much more than this much. Uh, one thing that we will talk a little bit about is some goods that exist more theoretically in the minds of economists and uh, in the economic textbooks, and they exist out there in the real world. But there are some goods that come close. So this is what we're talking about. Let's talk about a good that is what we call perfectly inelastic. So let's go ahead and draw another graph here. So we got price and quantity on that particular graph. Um, so again, if we're talking about a perfectly inelastic demand curve, and remember, inelastic curves tend to be steeper, then what do you think this curve might look like? Well, if you've guessed that it is a vertical line going straight up and down, then you've guessed correctly. In other words, this is what your demand curve will look like for a good that is perfectly inelastic. And what this means is that if the price is, say, one penny, or if the price is, say, a million dollars per unit, you're going to want the exact same amount, right? So at a price of, say, one cent, or at a price of a million dollars, you're buying the exact same quantity, or your quantity demanded hasn't changed. So again, this is something that exists more in the minds of economists than in the real world. There aren't too many goods that resemble this, uh, mostly just because if the price did go from a penny to a million dollars, most people couldn't afford to buy the same amount. But there are some goods that come close, and that would be life-saving medications. So a uh, quick story here from my past is back when I was 23 years, uh, uh, 23 years old, so about 13 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I needed four cycles of chemotherapy in order to stay alive. So the way it works is you're on chemotherapy for about a week, and then they give you about two weeks to recover, and then they put you on chemotherapy for another week, give you another two weeks to recover, and so forth and so on for four cycles. So I wanted the same four cycles of chemotherapy, no matter how much chemotherapy cost. Chemotherapy could have cost a penny per cycle, or it could have cost a million dollars per cycle. Either way, I'm going to want the same four cycles. If I need four cycles to stay alive, then I don't want less chemotherapy just because it costs more. I'm going to want that same amount of chemotherapy, no matter how much it costs. At the same time, I don't want more chemotherapy just because it's cheaper, for reasons if you've ever been on chemotherapy, I'm sure you understand. 
Another quick story here is that when I was getting my chemotherapy, because it's so uh, destructive to your body, you have to be on a pill first called Emend. Because I had four cycles of chemotherapy, I needed four prescriptions of Emend. And Emend consists of just three pills that you take uh, 24 hours before your chemotherapy cycle. And the prescription for Emend costs $330 just for those three pills. So every time you take a pill, it's like swallowing a $100 bill with a $10 chaser. So, and uh, going up to the pharmacist and telling her that I needed this prescription for amend, she kind of looked at me and said, now do you know that this prescription for amend, it costs $330 per prescription, do you still want it? And I told her, well, do I still need it? And she says, well, absolutely, you can't get your chemotherapy without it. I was like, well, then lay it on me, I still want it. Point being, it could have cost $300, it could have cost $3,000, I'm still going to want it because I need it to stay alive. So again, my um, uh, how much I want is very insensitive to the price of the good. The price of the good could go up by a lot and I'm still going to want the same amount. I think she was really just asking, could I still afford it? Or could I still pay for it? Because I looked like what I was, which was a poor college student at the time. But anyway, that's what perfectly inelastic curves tend to look, uh, tend to look like. Now, with that in mind, there's another type of good out there that, again, exists more in the minds of economists but, uh, than it does out in the real world, and that are goods that are perfectly elastic. But again, there's a lot of goods that come close, so it's kind of worth talking about here. So let's go ahead and draw another graph. So we got price, and we got quantity. Now, if elastic curves are flatter, and uh, we're talking about a good that is perfectly elastic, then what do you think a demand curve would look like for a perfectly elastic good? Well, if you guess that it'd be a perfectly flat or straight line, then you guess correctly, that's what your demand curve would look like there. And basically what this means is that you're gonna buy uh, various amounts of this good at any price, like say a dollar per good, but if the price were to go up by say one penny, so it goes up to say a dollar and one cent, then you're not gonna buy any of these uh, goods. And if the price were to go down to say 99 cents, so if it were to go down by one penny, then you would buy an infinite amount of this good, right? In other words, again, you're very responsive to a change in price, so much so that a one penny difference uh, could uh, change you from buying say infinite to zero or, uh, or, back, or uh, vice versa. So with that in mind, an example of this are goods that are exactly like one another. So for example, if you're talking about maybe one farmer's egg production, right? Well, while farmer's eggs is just like any other farmer's eggs, eggs tend to be pretty much exactly the same. You can't really tell the difference between them. So with that in mind, if the price of uh, one farmer's eggs goes up by one penny, right? Well, then nobody's going to buy eggs from that farmer because they can buy the exact same type of eggs from other farmers for a penny less. Now, if that farmer were to, say, lower the price of his eggs by one penny, well, then everybody would want to buy eggs from that farmer because he's selling the exact same product for a penny less. All right, so that's what you need to know about elasticity. Again, it's just how responsive we are to a change in price. Again, if you are more inelastic, those curves tend to be uh, vertical. If you're more elastic, those curves tend to be more horizontal or less steep. So with that in mind, that is the end of part two for chapter three. When we come back for part three of chapter three, we're going to do uh, my favorite part of the class, which is put these supply and demand curves together and talk about a market equilibrium. So I'm really looking forward to uh, making the next video. Until then, though, just let me know if you have any questions. Uh, shoot me an email or come visit me during those office hours and just let me know if you need anything. And just be ready to come back excited for part three of chapter three, where we're going to talk about that market equilibrium and how to shift those curves in equilibrium. So everybody have a good one. And again, let me know if you need anything. Take care.